Mr. Sapolsky, one of the things that I love about your work is that you try to take an even-handed view uh, at, at what you're looking at, and, and, you, and you work really hard to get an even-handed view. You don't just kind of take things at face value. That teaches me a lot. So, so thank you, sir. Welcome. Good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, a little bit on your bio. You study hormones, and you study neurons, and you do that year-round. But for more than 30 years, you've spent your summers studying uh, savanna baboons in uh, the grasslands of East Africa. Like I said, I admire your research. I admire how you teach. We have a mission at Lesson Lead to help people do better work so they can live better lives. And I'd like to focus really on the better lives part of that mission because you wrote a book called Behave, which is this uh, massive undertaking. I can't imagine how long it took um, that really takes us through human behavior. And you'll explain it better than I will, uh, but you're really kind of looking at things from genes to hormones to uh, contextual uh, differences from our environment uh, and how those impact our behavior. So I, I enjoyed the book immensely. Uh, I promise you I read it cover to cover, um, and, and, uh, and it paid off. Uh, you and about three other humans. Yeah, I, I, don't know if I'm in a, uh, I don't know if I'm in a unique group, uh, but I had a lot of fun reading it. So, 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 so thank you for writing it. Um, I'd like to talk about the better lives part because I think there's a lot we can learn about better lives from Behave. But I also think you know, your main study of stress and what you've learned about stress uh, can be immensely important to the folks who are listening. You wrote a book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. It implies that we do get ulcers and zebras don't. So can you tell me what are ulcers? Why do we get them and zebras don't? And um, what do we do about the stress in our lives? Well, ulcers used to be the flagship stress-related disease. It was the first one identified in the 1930s by this guy who's kind of the godfather of stress biology, all of that. And it was the defining stress causes ulcers. Then things got complicated, I don't know, in the 80s. Uh, somebody discovered that, in fact, ulcers were predominantly caused by a bacteria, Helicobacter pylorus. It's a bacterial infection. Give somebody antibiotics. Stress has nothing to do with it. Give this guy his Nobel Prize, all of that. Stress still has plenty to do with it because only about 10% of people with the bacteria in their gut actually get an ulcer. Stress tells your stomach, hey, you're running for your life right now. There's a lion coming after you. Don't worry about fixing your stomach walls right now. Do it tomorrow if there is a tomorrow. Delay all the long-term stuff. Delay the long-term stuff. And if you were getting chronically stressed, not because you're being chased by lions four times a day, but because of traffic jams and financial worries and blah, blah, all of that, you were continuously telling your stomach walls, if you have that bacteria there, do it tomorrow, fix it tomorrow. And what that encapsulates is kind of the core of why we get stress-related diseases, zebras don't. We are smart enough to invent chronic psychosocial stress. And that's a very different world for 99% of the beasts on this planet. Stress is three minutes of screaming terror on the savanna, after which it's either over with or you're over with. And we turn it on for 30-year mortgages. And the punchline of the entire field is when you are getting stressed, you were doing the exact same stuff with your body as does any other mammal or reptile or an amphibian or a bird or a fish. It's all built around dealing with stress the way like normal beasts do. And then we turn it on watching a movie and feeling terrified. We turn it on and feeling like moved and saddened by what happens to some character in there. We turn it on reading about people in refugee camps on the other side of the planet and no other animal could make sense of this. Some of the other primates are in the ballpark of being sophisticated enough. But if you're a zebra, a lion is chasing you, you're terrified out of your wits. And if you get away from the lion, as far as I can tell, and I have that of the periphery of my eyes, seen a lot of zebras over the decades. Um, as far as I can tell, 30 seconds later, all you're thinking about is, am I going to eat this blade of grass or am I going to eat that one? Gone. Finished. You run a stress response only when you're stressed if you're an animal that is not us. But if you're us, you can run a stress response anytime. That's what I'm hearing you say. Yep. And we run it most of all for reasons that make no sense to any other animal. 
okay, so by the time you get to primates, maybe you're smart enough to know, whoa, here we come to this riverbed crossing and there's a good chance there's a lion there. You can anticipate a real action with stressor and you could have an anticipatory stress response in that case. And that could be great. And that's much more sophisticated than a zebra or a fish can do. But only we can sit there and say, whoa, maybe social security won't exist by the time I'm like ready to retire. That's not anything. Sit down a hippo and try to describe why you're secreting stress hormones over that. And it's not going to make any sense at all, but it does to us. Or let alone, because I'm going to ask this person out when I see them in five days. And right now my stomach is churning. What's up with that? Asks the entire animal kingdom. Right. Wow. So this is a challenge, uh, a unique challenge. Um, and you speak a, a, a lot about how we might cope with it. What have you learned about how humans cope with stress? Like, and I want you to, I want you to tell me from like your loved one, what do you tell your loved ones about stress that you want them to know? For the same external reality, you were more likely to feel, be, get sick from stress if you feel like you have no outlets for the frustration being caused. Take a rat, give it shocks, and if it could gnaw on a bar of wood after each shock, it doesn't get an ulcer. For the same external reality, you are more at risk for stress and misery if you have no control. If you feel like you have no control, if you have no predictability, when is it coming? How bad is it going to be? How long is it going to last? What sort of coping strategy should I prepare? And most of all, when can I finally feel safe? And probably most importantly, for the same external reality, you are going to be more miserably stressed if you lack social support. And that's like, you know, baboons, a predictor of their old age is how much time they spend grooming when they're young adults. In lab rats, you're giving them shocks. And if they can go over to the other side of the cage and there's a rat, not any rat, but a rat they know and get along with, and they get to groom each other, the rat doesn't have a stress response. So lack of outlets, lack of control, lack of predictability, collectively using that to decide the world is getting worse and nobody's shoulder to cry on. Yeah, very good synopsis, thank you. I need a shoulder to cry on. Um, I need to displace my aggression, but not on other people, right? Because that is something that you see when you're studying primates that, that, that humans do as well. They are aggressed at, and they turn around, and they aggress at the next thing. So how, how do we stop that cadence? Yeah, like one of the greatest sources of like vertebrate misery on this planet is the fact that a very effective way of decreasing stress hormone secretion in an organism is to beat up on somebody smaller and weaker. As soon as somebody shows up who, thank God, is lower ranking than you because they're a newbie and just working in and you can dump on them whenever you want, the more you dump on them at that point, the lower your stress hormone levels are. And an incredibly sad thing is like two of the most effective ways of decreasing a stress response. One is to take it out on somebody else and the other is to eat M&Ms or like a high fat diet. It's like actually known how that works. So how can you do that in a more benign way? Right. What I take some comfort from is when you look at people being their worst in like a large global attitudinal way, you can have them fill out questionnaires. You can ask them what they believe about this or that. They may even tell you who they voted for last November kind of thing. Um, but the most effective way is to look at what their implicit biases are, their unconscious ones, the ones you can't sort of try to regulate. And there's a whole world of testing of that. The IAT, the implicit association test, incredibly cool. You can go on line and take them and discover all sorts of biases that you have that you really wish you didn't. But one really good piece of news in there is making people conscious of them is helpful. Yep. Not because it changes the implicit biases, but it changes your vigilance for it. Fantastic study showing this. You put people in brain scanners and you're flashing up pictures of faces. And in about 75% of people, you flash up a face of somebody of a different race and the amygdala activates in 60 to 70 thousandths of a second. Wow. Oh crap, this is absolutely hopeless. So where is there some hope? 
what you then see in the majority of those people, which is the amygdala explodes into activity. And about two, three seconds later, a part of the brain called the frontal cortex activates. What's the frontal cortex about? It's emotional regulation, impulse control, getting you to do the harder, better thing to do. Our frontal cortex roars into action. The thing it's best at is turning off the amygdala. What's that? That's you sitting there saying, don't think that way. That's not who I am. I'm better than this. The world needs people thinking differently. I got to watch out for feeling that way about stuff. It's very, very hard to make the implicit stuff go away. It can be done uphill battle the older you are, but at least what awareness of it does is give you the tools to try to be on top of it. And it's one of the realms in which cognitive surveillance of the worst of your visceral responses, you know, can make things better in the world. I just think this is so important because when I was growing up, I thought I would have to get rid of the instant, the instant, you know, biological reaction that I would have to something. And I would judge myself for having the instant biological reaction to something. And now what I'm hearing you say, and what I'm seeing uh, again and again, is there's this fast response and there's this slower response. And the fast response is largely, I can maybe practice it and winnow it down slowly, but surely over time, but it probably isn't going away. And it might not even be the most important place for me to spend my time working. Uh, exactly. The more important place for me to spend my time working is what I do in that slower response, how I contemplate. This is what I'm hearing you say. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. Exactly. I think basically, unless you're the Dalai Lama, it is really, really hardwired in us to make us them dichotomies. Fraction of a second, kids are doing it by 10 months of age, it's cross cultural, you know, all sorts of other ways of getting at it. There's hormones that worsen some aspects, it's totally hardwired in us. What is important in us, though, is we've got multiple us them categories in our heads, and which one is most important at any given moment can shift. Yeah, and a big part of your book, Behave, is about us recognizing uh, that we can very quickly uh, turn our hate onto other people, not even realize what we're necessarily doing it, think about them as less than human, uh, and then treat them in ways that we ourselves would never in a million years want to be treated. Is, is that accurate? Did I mischaracterize anything? No, nope, exactly. Yep. Yeah, th th thank you for writing that. Um, I'm going to go back to stress really quickly. Do we know if sleep has an impact on stress? And do we know if exercise has an impact on stress? Because in, in, in zebras, you say exercise is only stress reducing if I enjoy the activity. So people at home, yeah. like let's find exercise that we enjoy is what I, what I took from that. But then also sleep, anything, anything you have to add there? Okay, first with sleep, incredible vicious cycle you get into. When you were sleep deprived, you secrete elevated levels of stress hormones, the main one, cortisol, but there's a whole array of them. You have a stress response. So when you don't get enough sleep, you activate the stress response. When you've chronically activated your stress response, you have trouble falling asleep. Damn, vicious cycle there. Moreover, even when you fall asleep, you get less of what's called deep restorative sleep, like even sleep at that point is not going to be as restorative as it normally is. So you get caught in this vicious cycle. In terms of exercise, um, yeah, you bring up a first really important caveat that's not only extends to exercise, but any form of stress management, which is, yeah, yeah, it's great if every person on earth you know swears by it, but if you hate it and dread it, it's not going to do you any good. It's going to do exactly the opposite. Um, Stress management, it's got to be something you do regularly, not on the weekends. It's got to be something you set time out for um, rather than like you do it when you're on hold on the phone. It's got to be something that you actually like doing um, and it's got to be intrinsically healthy. You, you cite the Pareto principle or like the 80-20 the rule as, hey, uh, just starting, right, uh, is, uh, is often 80% of the battle. Just, just starting something and keeping doing it. Did I, did I get that right? I mean, you can decide that what your stress management technique is going to be is, I don't know, you're going to do hopscotch 20 minutes every day or whatever. And there's not a whole lot of precedent for that having marvelous cardiovascular effects or something for all I know, whatever. But the mere fact that probably like everyone you've got working around you and everyone I know, the mere fact that amid you running your life with, these are all the things I can't say no to because I've just got this piled up and piled up and running faster and faster to stay in the same place. 
you've actually said no to those enough to stop and do your hopscotch 20 minutes a day. Pareto, you're 80% of the way there for the exact same reason that you find when people have been chronically depressed, they feel better, not when they first see a psychotherapist or a psychiatrist for the first time, that often helps, but they start feeling better after they've made the appointment for the first time. I have gotten a hold of this enough that I matter enough to myself that I'm going to do something about it. Just doing that itself, it's exactly 80-20. It virtually doesn't matter what your stretch management technique is. If hell or high water, nonetheless, every other day you spend doing that for 20 minutes, and it's something that is generally sort of calming and, and you know, reflective, you're 80% of the way there. Yeah, and for somebody who studies stress a long time, I really appreciate you sharing that with us because um, one, of, one of the big breakthroughs that I had uh, with my therapist this past year is he uh, looked at me and said, hey, Max, um, you equate stimulation with good and you equate a lack of stimulation with not good. Um, and he, he, he asked that as a question so I could you know, agree. Uh, and I said, yeah, I, nobody's ever pointed that out to me is that you know, me being stimulated is something that I'm like, oh, you know, that's a good day. I've stressed myself in some way, tried to achieve something. And his point was, hey, there's a lot of good over here as well in a lack of stimulation, you know, in, in calm. Um, and let's try to bring a little balance to the situation. A point which you bring up wonderfully, like the purpose of thinking about this stuff is not to cure us of stress. Right. Um, absolutely not, because you get it the right amount and it's perfect. We love it. We pay money to be stressed the right amount. Yeah. And what's the right amount? We call it stimulation. We call it play. We call it where it's not that severe of a stressor. It doesn't go on for too long. Roller coaster rides are not three weeks long kind of thing. And it's in a setting that overall feels benevolent. Play is when you suspend the consequences of exploring what it's like to have less control and predictability than you normally have. And when it's the right amount, it's the greatest thing out there. It's wonderful, great sound bite. Uh, the opposite of play is not work. The opposite of play is depression. I've started to make more time for play in my life, but I'm still nowhere near the point where I think I found a, a balance of it. What I understand about play is it's a, it's a non-objective driven, right? I'm, I'm just doing it to, a, to do it. And I'm learning probably as I'm doing it. Um, like it might be painting. I'm not painting to impress somebody. There's nothing on the line. I'm painting to enjoy the process of painting, uh, what, whatever comes of it. That is what I, uh, I've learned a play is, but I'd like to hear from you what you think play is and what benefits it can bring to our life. For people in our world, and again, I'm guessing it's real familiar to people who are hanging out with you occupationally, um, there are very few domains of our life where we're not at least subliminally having a, how can I do this better? How can I do this faster? How can I do this more gloriously and glorified, whatever? And pick something that you're crappy at and you're never gonna get better at it, but you like doing it and it's the best. And the ability to do that is another one of those 80-20 rules to step away from our drive towards like everything is meant to make us have a better resume that you can roll up and hit somebody over the head with over how wonderful you are. Um, like do something you're crappy at for its own sake. You mentioned this thing called reappraisal multiple times in Behave. I think the idea of re reappraisal is really interesting. Um, I'd love to know from you, what is it? Uh, how does it help me? Um, and how do I do it? It's contextual stuff. It's when you're sitting there saying, yeah, I screwed up, but it was because of the circumstance, not because I'm um, a failure. Yeah. when you're making it const rather than constitutional situational, when you're sitting there saying, yeah, I screwed up at this, but there's a lot of things in my life I'm good at. When you're yeah. saying, yeah, I screwed up at this, but I'm loved and I love the people who love me. Um, so it's a way of putting things in perspective. And for most of us who are lucky enough, when something crappy happens to us to be able to say, yeah, but that's not my whole life. Yeah, but this is this artificial situational circumstance. Yeah, but I've got a lot to fall back on. Reappraisal there is great. Of course, what we're ignoring is the like masses of people out there for whom no, 
They can't say, but the rest of my life is just fine. And they can't say, no, this is an anomaly. And they can't say, but at least at the end of today, I can go back to my loved ones because I'm lonely and socially isolated, blah, blah. But when you have stuff to reappraise too, reappraising, especially with the right parameters, is enormously helpful because most of our circumstances are circumstantial and this too shall pass. And the larger things you can fall back on will still be there. Uh, behave looks at behavior through the lens of basically anything that could impact behavior that we know about today and basically says, it depends where behavior comes from based on genes, based on hormones, based on uh, social context, based on environmental context. Uh, it's context dependent. Uh, did, I, did I get that right? Yep, absolutely. Um, I like to focus on uh, many times in the book when you talk about humans at their best, uh, because I think, we, I think the more we have examples of what works when humans do things that, that are working well, I, I think the better. Um, so I, ha I have some things to go on here. One of the things I don't want to miss with you is humans at our best when we're, when we're trying to help other people. Uh, there's this idea uh, in kind of popular culture that empathy is a really, really good thing and we should all have more empathy. Um, but you look at a lot of scientific studies that say uh, if we run empathy too hard, too much, uh, it can drain our energy. Uh, we're, we're so empathetic that we're feeling the other person's pain. Uh, and in that feeling of that pain, uh, we are draining our own energy. We're going this, to the stress response with them. Uh, and then we might not have any energy left over to act. Uh, and and you, you argue that you know, compassionate action is probably more important than feeling the full amount of pain. Now, I, will, I think this is what you're arguing. So then, then you mentioned something about a healthy level of detachment. I could use more of this. I could use more of this, and I think my teammates and my friends could use more of this, an understanding of how much empathy is helpful. Uh, is it is only so much that we can still have enough energy to act? Talk, talk to me. Yeah, there's a world of difference between feeling somebody else's pain, empathy, and actually doing something about it, acting compassionately. And feeling empathic is not a very good predictor of who's going to actually step out of the crowd and do the difficult, scary, endangering, compassionate thing. And a danger, of course, is to decide that empathy is a virtual in and of itself. Take somebody and they are being exposed to somebody else's pain. If their blood pressure goes up like crazy, that's a predictor of someone who's going to say, this is so painful, this is so painful, I can't take it anymore, and they have to flee. If you can sit there and contemplate somebody else's pain, and you're not turning on a massive stress response in your body, that's a pretty good predictor that you're saying, I feel terrible for them rather than I feel terrible for me if I were going through it. That's a great physiological predictor of who is going to be able to act compassionately, a certain degree of detachment. Um, if you're going to be a good doctor, if you're going to be a good philanthropist, if you're going to be whatever, you don't get effective at it until you've gotten a certain degree of detachment. Um, you often pay a price in your personal life getting to that point. But nonetheless, empathy, it's not enough by itself. And predicting who's actually going to do the compassionate act, especially when it's a costly one, um, you got to get some distance from your own pain and feeling their pain and being able to detach from it a bit. And even just as importantly, you've got to be on guard for the fact that you're going to feel somebody else's pain unevenly. You're going to feel it much more for someone who looks like you, who suffers like you, who is local rather than on the other side of the planet, all of that. Using feeling badly is a really bad litmus test for deciding who deserves your help. And using feeling badly is a really bad pathway to decide that's in and of itself a guarantee that I'm going to go do the right thing. Yeah, very helpful. What it mostly means is you're going to be looking out for your own sense of self, of well-being, or that of people who are just like you. Thank you. I want to move on to from empathy to forgiveness because you you talk a bit about there's some cognitive benefits to forgiveness, right? Uh, and I, I, I and you know you you consider yourself an atheist. You're not coming at forgiveness from any other reason than uh, hey, there's something to learn here, uh, as far as I understand it. What have you learned about the cognitive benefits of forgiveness? Why does it help people? It decreases a massive cognitive load that people carry when they hate. It's freeing not to hate. 
and like people who've been in circumstances a billion times worse than mine who get to a point of maybe not forgiving the person who did whatever to them, maybe reconciling to that person's continued existence in the same world as your own, maybe even deciding they're not worth your time to even pay attention to any of those are versions where the uniform description is, it was so freeing. It's a freeing thing. One of those Booker T. Washington quote, I will allow no man to soil my soul by making me hate him. Mm. So if you're operating without soul, souls in your picture, I'll allow no person to cause me to suppress my immune system by chronically hating him. Yeah, because that's what we're allowing. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Uh, you have a depre depression lecture on YouTube. Uh, it's, you have your whole kind of intro to behavior. Is that the right term for it at Stanford, the whole course? Yeah. Uh, there's a lecture on depression that uh, millions of people have watched uh, that uh, has moved me uh, and, and I've watched it about four times in my life. One of, the things that you, one of the things that you mentioned in that is, especially in a community like this, and when you're saying this, I think you're talking about the Stanford community, um, uh, where everyone is expected to be golden and functioning and flawless and just gliding through life. This idea of being you know, unable to cope with, uh, with depression is even harder. The idea that like, hey, aren't I supposed to have it all together? And I, I bring this up because it's something that I love talking about. I love the idea of kind of anti-perfectionism, acknowledging that we're whole people. We don't excel at everything, right? We have below average qualities, average qualities, above average qualities. Um, and, but if we think we're supposed to be golden and functioning and flawless and gliding through life, uh, it can cause us to, to, to be embarrassed when, when we're not. Um, what is the, what, would you, what I wrote here is like, to, to be our best, in what ways would you like to see less embar embarrassment in humans? It's a cliche, and it's a cliche when it's doled out on like a doily embroidered that you hang up on your like refrigerator with a magnet there kind of thing. But the, you are not alone, is unbelievably powerful. The sound bite that by definition, you can only compare your inner self with everybody else's persona is incredibly liberating. Yeah. And the notion that our goal is not perfection, but good enough. Good enough because good enough is good enough to feel like you have lived a life that's worth it. Good enough to derive the knowledge that it's a better place than if you hadn't shown up there or that somebody loves you and is dependent on you in their life. Good enough is good enough and it should be really central to it. It's a world in which it is so easy to decide that everybody else is polished because people get good at their veneers. Your internal self cannot be compared to everybody else's veneer because it's by definition an unfair comparison. And you're not alone, you're not alone, you're not alone. You, you tell this story uh, about a group of primates um, who uh, the aggressive uh, males in that group um, died through, from tuberculosis. They were all going to the same spot and that spot was attracting aggressive uh, uh, primates. They ate some meat there and died of tuberculosis. So you basically had this troop um, that had all the aggressive males wiped out. And you got to watch them many years later. Uh, and I'd love to know what you saw um, because this story is very powerful to me and I'll, t I'll tell you why. It was amazing. It's probably the thing that has most impacted me of my 33 years of hanging with baboons in the Serengeti. Um, not only was it the case that if you were a more than, aggr more than averagely aggressive male, you died from this tainted meat. But in addition, if you were socially disconnected, um, because all of this happened every morning when the garbage was being dumped at this lodge. So you would be willing to pick up, go a mile or two to go fight with a bunch of strange males. And this is the time of day where baboons are doing their most socializing and their most grooming and gossiping and all that sort of thing. So you were aggressive and you were willing to give up all the social connectedness to go to do this. So it killed half the males in the troop. And what you were left with was twice as many females as males, which was very atypical in the baboon world. And the guys who were there were nice guys. They 
got into fights, but they didn't beat up on somebody smaller as much after they lost the fight. They were more socially affiliative. They spent more time grooming. They actually like groomed a female back for a few minutes after she groomed him for an hour. This is like a prince of a baboon you want to take home to mom to meet kind of thing. And what you saw was the entire culture of this troop changed. They became more peaceful. They became more socially affiliated. They sat closer to each other. They had less fighting. They had lower stress hormone levels. Their immune systems worked better, which was the stuff I was mostly studying. By a decade later, after this TB outbreak, the troops still had this characteristic. But the key thing is, all of the nice guy males from the time of the TB pandemic, they had long since died of old age. All of the adult males in the troop now who were carrying on these behaviors, they had shown up as jerky adolescents from some other baboon troop. And somehow they were learning, we don't do crap like that here. That's not the way we do stuff here. It was a case of cultural transmission. And I spent most of my efforts trying to piece in piece apart what was going on. And it took these guys about six months when they joined up. They were just as jerky as adolescents transferring to any other troop. And it was the social culture that basically showed that in a setting in which a baboon doesn't get dumped on by anyone else who's higher ranking, in a setting in which you get socially affiliated easily, average baboon troop, you're some squirrely adolescent male who shows up. It's an average of 70 days before somebody grooms you. In this troop, it was an average of four days. In a world in which you were like being treated better, you have a default state of calming down and being less stressed and thus less in need of displacing aggression onto the smaller and weaker. And what I always summarize this with is starting in the 60s, baboons were not just metaphorically, they were literally the textbook example of inevitable primate aggression and male dominance and stratified societies. And they are, this is their nature and they are like our ancestors living on the savannah. It took one generation to show that baboons had the cultural malleability of them to show that none of that stuff was inevitable. In other words, if baboons have that degree of flexibility lurking in them, saying there's any really awful stuff that's inevitable about human behavior, you're way underestimating us as primates. Yeah, you said it right here. Anyone who says that our worst behaviors are inevitable knows too little about primates, including us. And I just, I want to, I want to, I want to end on that point because um, it is so easy to get lost in the fact that, you know, we treat one another the way we treat one another and it's just inevitable. Um, but what I'm hearing you say is uh, we can change our, our cultures, our, our groups that we hang out in. We can treat one another differently and we can change a lot in that process. We are malleable creatures who adapt to the cultures that we live in. So how do we want to change our culture? And if we show up that way, we can make a big damn difference is what I'm hearing. Yeah, amid us being nothing more or less than the sum of our biology, there's a lot of room for optimism. Robert Sapolsky, Professor Sapolsky, thank you for making time today to share some things that you've learned, uh, to teach us some things. It has been an immense pleasure. Well, likewise. Thanks for having me on, Max. You bet.